Our reading text this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the land, out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God said, also said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God, of Je the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and I am, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. This is the word of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, as we open up your word this morning, we believe that it is the truth. We believe that it is one of the ways that you reveal yourself to us. We believe that this is a living word. We believe that this word can transform us inside and out. We believe that there's something that you want to teach each and every one of us this morning. It is marvelous for me to think that you brought all of us to this place to listen to this word being preached this morning. I pray that it would land in fertile soil. I pray that you would have your way in us through the scriptures this morning. We pray that you would. Last week we read Psalm 146, and in Psalm 146 there, was, there were three possessive pronouns. And then if you guys can remember it, my God, his God, and our God. The word Yahweh, or the name Yahweh, was also mentioned nine times in our psalm last week. And uh, it really struck a chord with me. How wonderful is it to know that we can know God, the creator and the sustainer of all things, by name. And that we can call him by his name, and that we can say he is mine and he is ours. And as I prayed this week uh, to start a new sermon, and I was thinking about what we should preach and praying about it for the next season, I asked myself the question Isn't knowing God the most fulfilling experience a human can have? And I'm asking you that question as well this morning Isn't knowing God the most fulfilling experience a human can have? Knowing your maker, knowing the one you came from. The picture I have in my head is the picture of a child, a baby, lying in the arms of his or her parents. There's a peace there. There's a fulfillment there. 
There's a safety and a protection there. And a baby doesn't even understand all the intricacies of human physiology and how he or, her, how he or she was created, but they know that I come from this person in whose arms I lie now. It's the same with us if we know God. Right? It's that same fulfilling experience. And that question led me to a, to a realization that you don't only know uh, someone by name, but you also know someone through their story. Think about it. I said earlier, my name is Reino Meyer. And in this week, I googled Reino Meyer to see what pops up. And surprise, surprise, there are more Reino Meyers than only myself. Okay? So there are others. So if you talk to someone about me, the way you will be sure that you're talking about the same Reino Meyer is by telling their story. I mean, imagine, you speak to someone, I know Reina Mayer, yeah, I also know Reina Mayer, yeah, he's a great guy, yeah. the work they're doing up in Ghana at the moment is really, really phenomenal. Uh, Ghana, yeah, then I'm talking about Reina Mayer, the mining engineer who was born and raised in Stellenbosch, who's working up in Ghana, building a new mine, billion dollar mine, that Reina Mayer, no, 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 no. I'm talking about Reina Mayer, who was uh, uh, raised in Pretoria, his wife was Afrikaans, who went to Monument Park Primary, went to Mothercliff High School, and who passed the Spiritual City. Oh, okay, no, 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 no. Even though they have the same name, they've got different stories. So you affirm or confirm who you're talking about by also telling their story. It's a simple illustration, but you guys will see where I am heading with this. Have you ever realized that it is also the case with the word God? Okay? We have world religions, and we have known religions on this planet we live, and every world religion or every known religion also has a God. So which God are we talking about? Right? Because someone else, which is not believe in Jesus Christ, will talk about God. Someone else will invoke the name of God in some way or form. And the question is, who exactly are we talking about here? Do you mind telling me the story of your God so that I know that we are on the same page? We live in a pluralistic world. There's not only one religion in this world. And therefore we cannot assume that if I say thank God and you say thank God, that we're talking about the same God. Celebrities invoke the name of God and use the name of God and they receive Oscars and Grammys. Politicians say we do this in the name of God or God said or God will. Are we talking about the same God here? We need to check. We need to verify by name and by story. Now, as Bible-believing Christians and as a gospel centered church, when we say God, we are talking about Yahweh. And there's a story connected to this Yahweh. He is God, His name is Yahweh, and He is our God. That is what we believe. And that's also the theme for my sermon this morning. We are talking about a very specific God. Think about the illustration I used with my own name. Now, I shared last week that it is my and our desire that our church family would be revitalized in this time. That our church family will be strengthened in this time. Listen to this sentence. It's a little bit of an earworm. It is my wish that we would not only survive, but that we would thrive. I thought about that myself. And I feel really proud. Because I'm not a tweeter or a grammar, but I thought that was a really cool sentence. But that is our wish. That we would not only survive, but that we would thrive. So we decided to do a whole series on God's being, on God's character, on God's name, on God's work, on God's great act of salvation. And I really trust that you would experience the above mentioned, the revitalization and the strengthening through this series. So you've seen the theme for today. Let me show you our map, which will also be on the slide. Three points, guys. Classic sermon, not too difficult to remember. First point, who is God? Second point, what does Yahweh mean? You guys see the hashtag? Nerd alert. We are going to go seriously deep in the second point. Okay? So if you feel tired and if you feel weary, coffee is right there. Stretch the legs and go get yourself some before the second point because it's going to go really, really deep. And then thirdly, who is Jesus? And you guys will see how it all fits together. So let's start with the first point. Who is God? The first three words in Genesis, in Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, He created God. So, in the beginning, God created. Those are the first three words. And the word used for God is the word Elohim. 
It's plural. It's a royal plural. It speaks of a being. It speaks of authority. And if you just read page one of our Bible, you'll see that this God is already narrowed down in the sense that he was there in the beginning. So it says something about his being. It says that he created. It says that he had power. And it says he created the heavens and the earth. So it's Barashi Bara Irwin, et ha shamayim ve et ha ares. The heavens and the earth. That's the first sentence of the Bible in Hebrew. And I'm throwing out the Hebrew today because Yahweh is also a Hebrew word and you'll see why this is all important. So it narrows it down at least to know that if this God is the one we believe in, he, has a, he is a God who was, he is a God who has power, he is a God who created stuff. So the story we read clarifies the name that is given to him. And that's the joy of the Bible, is as we read through the Bible, this name gets revealed more and more and more and more. And the story develops, and we get to know more of this God we find in the third word of our Bible, called God. Okay, and the story progresses. Let's look at Exodus 2, uh, verses 23 to 24. It will be up on the slides for you. So the story has progressed. I'll recap it now, but I just want you to see the word God. I put it in bold and I underlined it. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, Elohim, the Hebrew word. Okay, so what do we know about him at this point? We know that he always was. We know that he created and you know that he has power. So it makes sense that if people experience some sort of hardship, they would uh, cry out to the one who has power. 24. And God, Elohim again, heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant. Okay, so this God has been part of the story up until this point. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. So this God, this creator God named Elohim, cares for people. We know it by this point. And then it says, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Okay, so let's recap the story. God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates human beings. He blows his breath into human beings. He calls them little statues. He commissions them to multiply and to be fruitful. And he says, take care of my creation with me. Let's work together. Let's be together. You can. Uh, you have a massive area to play in. Do not play in this area because this is mine. Human beings play in God's area. They sin. The relationship breaks down. And then God starts up again through Noah. And then God starts up again through Abraham. So that's the first name we see uh, in this text. And God says to Abraham, dude, I'm going to take you and your family. I'm going to work my plan through your family. I'm going to work my blessing for the earth, because that was my heart in the beginning, through your family and through Isaac and through Jacob. And the whole book of Genesis tells the story of Abraham, Abraham and his family and his kids. And a big chunk goes to Jacob and then Joseph. And now they find themselves in Egypt because there was famine in the land and they are now oppressed by the Pharaoh and by the people in Egypt. Okay, so what do we learn? Just by reading this, we read that this God has compassion on his people because he hurt them. We read that this God is committed to goodness because in the beginning everything he created was tof, is the Hebrew word. It's good, it's beautiful. He created human beings and said they're very good, very tof. Name. That's not actually how you say it in Hebrew, but I thought it would sound cool if I say it like that. And we see that this is a God that committed to fixing the brokenness of the world only by reading these couple of verses. We see that He is a God of a covenant. We see that He is a God who does what He says. This is who God is. The first question, my first point, is who is God? And this is the answer to that question. He is all of these things. And where do we get this? By following the story, by seeing how he reveals himself. Okay. Now in Genesis, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, a new name pops up. Okay? Look in your Bible, it says in verse 2, and the angel of the Lord. This is the first time we see the word Lord in the Bible. So who's that? The whole time up until now has been God. And the Hebrew word for that is Elohim. 
And now all of a sudden the word Lord pops up. So the, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Okay? So there's the crowd of people. There's this God who heard them. And then all of a sudden there's the story of a guy shepherding some sheep. Going to a mountain called Wirib, which will be named Sinai a little bit later. And here the name Yahweh gets introduced to us. So what do we learn about Yahweh? Look at verse 5. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Can you guys see as the story develops, we learn more about this God. So we've seen that He was the one there in the beginning and the power to create, everything I've said. We've seen that He's a covenant God. And now we learn that this God is also holy. So what is that? Well, we're going to have to keep on reading the story to see how this character trait of God develops. Because the story will keep on revealing the identity and the character of God. But for now at least, what we should know is this God says, I am other. I am different. I am unique. Certain things don't belong with me. I am like no one else. Let me show you a picture of a kitchen counter. A kitchen counter in a house. Well, I think this is a really lovely kitchen. This is not our kitchen. Let me just be clear. But this is a really lovely kitchen. So a kitchen counter, guys, is sacred space in a house. Why? Because it's meant to prepare food. It should stay clean. We've got two toddlers. For some reason, they see it as a jungle joke. For some reason, they take off their, I was just in Pick and Pay, flip flops, and they put it on the kitchen counter. For some reason, whatever they bring in from the outside, they put on the kitchen counter. And every single time we go, whoa, whoa, dude, this space, not meant for your pluckies. Pluckies is the Afrikaans word for flip flops. This space not meant for buckets and spades. This space not meant for bugs and leaves and all the stuff that you carry in. This space is other, special, it's reserved. Now, Moses was learning a sheep. How do you guys think he smelt? What do you guys think Moses had on his Jerusalem cruiser flip flops? <laughs> Lots of sheep stuff. And God says, Whoa, certain things don't belong with me, do they start? By taking off your shoes. I am holy. And then he further clarifies his identity by telling his own story. Look in your Bible and let's go back to verse 6. He says, I am the God of your father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. Verse 8, I have come to deliver them. Verse 9, Behold, the cry has come to me. So do you see how God does the introduction? He immediately reveals something of his character, and then he makes sure that Moses knows who he is by telling him his story. And by telling his story, he reveals to Moses that he cares deeply about humans. And he cares deeply about how humans treat one another. Because he says, I have cared about you the whole time, I'm your covenant God, and what is happening to you now is not right, and therefore I will set it right. I will save you, and I will bring deliverance, because I care about you. So this God, who's God in the beginning, Elohim, who's now called Yahweh, is revealed as a God who gets involved when there is evil. When there is evil in the world, He cares. And he gets involved. And he gets involved in this story by sending Moses. Now guys, there's a fascinating theme to study in the Bible. And that is why does God choose to act through human beings? But that's a huge rabbit hole. So if I go down it now, I'll only be back up by lunchtime. So I'm just going to leave it. And then just lob that one at you. Think about it. Why does God not get involved directly himself? Because he will in ten commandments, but he'll start by doing it through a human. Resist the rabbit hole. Resist the rabbit hole. Okay. So he says he'll, uh, he's going to send Moses. And then Moses rejects it. Moses is hesitant in this story. And Moses asks the question, who am I? That you would send me. I'm not qualified. 
I can't do this. Do you guys see that God ignores him? And he doesn't answer him. God just answers him with, uh, it doesn't matter who you are, do you know who I am? And then he reveals himself to him even more. It doesn't matter who you are, what matters is who I am. And let me tell you who I am. So let's study verses 11 to 14. This is the second point. What does Yahweh mean? And like I said, lots of nerd stuff going on here. So look at all the bold, look at all the underlines. I'm going to take us through those now. So God says, doesn't matter who you are, let me tell you who I am. And the first revelation God gives him is Echwech Imach. So I want you to listen to those sounds. Echwech, Wach, Wech. We'll get to these sounds a little bit later. But he says to him, it doesn't matter who you are, who I am is the one that is with you. And the one that will be with you. So God describes himself in verse 12 by these two Hebrew words, Echwech Imach. I am and I will continue to be with you. And Moses, let me tell you what will happen. I will bring the people out of Egypt and you will serve me on this mountain. Okay, so God shows his divine foresight by revealing that he will be with him and he knows what's going to happen. Isn't that a comforting word to you? That wherever you are, God is with you now and He will continue to be with you because that is who He is. And if He wants to work with you, it doesn't matter who you are, what matters is who He is. Right? So the whole revelation of what Yahweh means starts with being with, with presence, with continuous presence. Not only once off, but forever. Because we tend to read that as, listen Moses, I've uh, got a team meeting in a couple of minutes, but I'll be back with you at some point. That's not what God says. God says, I will be with you all this way and all these things that are going to happen to you. And then Moses goes, that is absolutely phenomenal. Clearly, you're not going to answer my question about who am I, so let me ask you one more about who you are. If I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers, check the story, that's the God I'm talking about. I'm not talking about any other gods you might have heard of. I'm talking about the God of your fathers. Hey, reminds me, Jack, you know that God that also created everything in the beginning? That God, that's the one I'm talking about? If they ask me, what is his name, what shall I say? Now listen to what God says. God says, Echwe, Esher, Echwe. That's the Hebrew. Did you hear it? Similar to the first one. Echwe, Imam, I will be with you. Now it's Echwe, Esher, Echwe. I am who I am. And also, I will be what I will be because I am what I am and for always will be. That's the depth of those words that God speaks to him in verse 14. I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. The best way for me to translate Yahweh is in this small sentence. And I'm going to leave it there for us for a second just to read. This is what Yahweh means. I am and will continue to be what I am and will forever be. Your jaw should be on the floor now because this is an unbelievable revelation of God Himself. What more do you want in a God? What more could you hope for? In a God. This God says, I am and will continue to be what I am. I have revealed to you what I am and I am that and I will continue to be that and I will forever be that. I will not change. Think about this for a second, guys. If you open up the dictionary and you look at the word mercy, God is there, Yahweh. If you open up the dictionary and you look at the word perfect, Yahweh is there. If you open up the dictionary and you look at the word consistent, Yahweh is there. If you open up the dictionary and you look at the word care, Yahweh's name is there. Because He's merciful, perfect, consistent. He cares and He's present. And He says by His name, I will always be this. I will not change. I am that now and I will stay that. What a marvelous God. What a beautiful name. Think about the stark contrast to human beings. 
You think someone's friendly until you get to know them. And then you realize that they are only sometimes friendly. You think that someone has a servant heart until you get to know them. And then you realize that they are only sometimes servant hearted. That's probably one of the biggest sobering experiences of being married. Right? Because when you date, your boyfriend's always pretty. And your girlfriend's always pretty. Until you get married, and like the second day you go, oh, realizing now that that is not a permanent state. You can't always be who you are or who you reveal yourself to be. We are only sometimes these things, but God is always these things by virtue of His name. Yahweh is always merciful, always perfect, always loving, always consistent, and will forever be. He will not change. That is what His name means. Because he said in verse 12 already, I will be with you. And then he confirms that I will be with you by his name. And then in verse 15, Rudolf, if you can just put verse 15 up for us, please. You'll see, Echwe changes to Yahweh. When his name is in the mouth of someone else. Then in verse 15, he says, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh. Not Echwe, Yahweh, the Lord of your fathers, the God of Abraham, there's the story, there's the story, has sent you, and this is my name forever. Okay? I mean, it's the third time he's confirmed who he is, because he wants you to really hear it. And he wants Moses to really understand it. And he wants Moses to really believe it. Because this is really important for his people who's in a really tough space who need salvation. He confirms who he is and he confirms that he will not change. And he gives himself a name and he says, that is my name forever. So Moses can't stand in front of the people and say, Echwe, send me. Because the only person who can ever say Echwe is God himself. I am. Yahweh, he is. That is who sent me. And that's where God's name, that's where God comes from. There we go. Our God, the Christian God, is Yahweh Elohim. The God who has the power, the God who created, the God who always was, but the God of this marvelous story with these human beings who keeps his part of the covenant, who never changes, and who will always and forever be with us. What's that God's name? His name is Yahweh. That's God. That's what we believe in. Third point. Let's land. Who is Jesus? Now, I don't know if you can just show me the I am slide, please. You guys can imagine if you are part of uh, the, the people of God, part of the Israelites, part of the group of people reading this story that we just read together, these words carry on a lot of time. And these words are only spoken by God Himself. That's why I showed you the change from Echwe to Yahweh. No human being can say these words, I am, with the same authority that God says it. So all through the Old Testament, all through the Jewish faith, all through the lives of the people of Israel, these words were so holy and so sacred and so profound that they did not even say it. So you would read in the Hebrew scripture, Yahweh, but you would say the word Adonai. Because saying Yahweh is just a little bit too courageous. Because God is so holy that I can't actually even pronounce His name. So even if I would read the Hebrew scriptures with Jewish people in this day, they would read over the word Yahweh from right here and they would say Adonai. So these words carry a lot of weight. Now, who is Jesus? Jesus is the one who uses these words and confirms that He is Yahweh. Yahweh Elohim. That He is the one that was there in the beginning. He's the same one of whom the story is told right through the Old Testament. And then Jesus uses these words. Now, guys, in the time that Jesus lived, this would have shocked the people. 
that he would then use the words I am and then make statements that sounds like he's speaking like God. And Jesus did it. And by virtue of doing it, said, exactly. It's me. That's why the Gospel of John, let me just turn there now, I wasn't planning on reading this, but let me read it anyway. The Gospel of John starts with these words. In the beginning, Bereshit, it's the same word as Genesis 1, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, oh sorry, not was, was, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the life of men. And then it says in 1.14, This Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then the Gospel of John tells the story of this Word dwelling among us, making grand statements like this. Seven times Jesus uses, I am. And by saying I am, he says, I am Yahweh. I'm not a God. I am the God. I'm the God that two-thirds of the Bible tells you about. You've read all these stories. You've heard all these stories. You've seen generation after generation recording these stories. I am the God of these stories. And I'm using the same language as that God. He said, and I'm saying to you, I am. I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door of the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way and the truth and the life, and I am the true vine. Guys, do you need any of these? Your answer today is Jesus. And Jesus is not only a wise counselor or a clever teacher, Jesus is God himself who became a human being. That is why we are a gospel-centered church. Are you hungry and worn out? Get some bread. That bread's name is Jesus. That's important for us to know. Because the cries of the people go up to God. That God's name is Yahweh. And He says, I have food and sustenance for you. Are you uh, trotting around in darkness? Get some light. Who's the light? Jesus is the light. And not only the light for you, but the light for the whole world. It says in Greek, the light of the cosmos, of everything. It's way bigger than centurion, guys. It's the light of the cosmos. Do you need entrance into the kingdom of God? There's a door for you. Use it. Do you need to be taken care of today? Do you need to be tended to? Do you need to be led to waters and green pastures? Do you need to take a rest? The answer is Jesus, because He is the good shepherd. Have you lost vitality? Have you lost life? Do you long for something new? The answer is Jesus, because He is the resurrection and the life. That life there in Greek is zoe, or actually zaur. It means living forever. If that's what you want, there's the answer. So Elohim in the beginning, who was given the name Yahweh, who says, I will forever be. He is all of these things. The story reveals him more to us. Have you lost your way? There's the answer. Jesus is the way. Are you wondering where truth can be found? There's the truth. It's right there to be found. Are you wondering what will give you life and fulfillment? There's it. That was a joke. There it is. Jesus is the life. Do you feel disconnected? Do you feel out of sorts? Do you feel like you're not finding what you need? Be connected to the vine and abide in the vine. It's such an intimate, such an intimate description of God. Who is He? He's the true vine. You can be connected to Him. And if you're connected to Him, you will bear great fruit because He's the vine and we are the branches. Jesus is God. And He came to earth to reconcile us with Him and with God, this grand Elohim God, who is the same yesterday, today and forever. He covered for us. He paid for all of our sins. He was raised from the dead so that we can have that life, life, life that's being talked about here in John. 
and He made a way for us to simply say, by faith, that we believe in Him, and then in our reconciliation of us. Guys, think about this. God the Father looks at me today and He sees no sin. God the Father looks at you today and He sees no sin. Because we've been covered. Isn't that just absolutely phenomenal? I do repent from my sin. I do say to God, I was on this track and now I'm turning my back on that and I'm uh, back on this track. Will you please forgive me? And then God says, dude, the forgiveness has been worked ages ago. Let's keep going. If I want to talk to God about all my sin and the things that I feel so poorly about, He's going to go, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. I've forgiven that ages ago. Let's keep going. Let's keep the relationship. Stop cutting yourself off from me. Stop creating distance between us. Okay? So our repentance doesn't bring forgiveness. Jesus' blood brings forgiveness. Our repentance repairs the relationship so that we can get going again in the relationship. God made all of this uh, possible for us through sending His Son, Jesus. So Yahweh is our God. And He came to earth and He revealed Himself to us as Jesus Christ. We can read about Him. We can believe in Him. We can put our faith in Him. We can put our trust in Him. And we'll be fed, we'll have light, we'll be in, we'll be tended for, we'll experience a regeneration in our lives, we will have life everlasting, we will have our way, we will never doubt because we know the truth, and we will abide in Him, and we will bear great fruit. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, You are astounding and awesome and brilliant and meant to be worshipped and revered and respected by us. We see you clearly this morning, Lord Jesus, that you are this great and wonderful God who has all the power and all the authority, who has always cared about human beings, who made a covenant with us and kept that covenant by virtue of you coming to this world. We are so thankful that you can have us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would read these I am statements and that it would bring real revitalization to our lives. That we would not walk in darkness. That we would not feel like we are That we would not feel excluded. That we would not doubt in the truth. That we would not feel dark in the earth. But that, we be, but that we would be resurrected. And that we would experience the life that you've come to give us. Draw us close to you this morning. Help us to abide in you as the vine. Help us to bear great fruit. As we abide in you. Yahweh, our God, meet us in this time. We pray that you